everybody. Happy Halloween. Welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for sharing this Halloween season with me. And although sadly it is coming to a close, I do have a little surprise for you. I had planned on doing the case of Mark Kilroy for Halloween this year, and I spent weeks researching it, at which point I found out there was so much more to the case. So much that it would be difficult to fit it into one Halloween episode, so I will be covering that case next month, and it's absolutely bananas. There's a new twist and turn around every corner. It's so shocking. It's so sad. It's so shocking. I knew that it deserved a series. But the case we're talking about today is just as shocking with its own sets of twists and turns, and it's very much like the Mark Kilroy case because it revolves around the concept of human sacrifice. In today's video, we are not just going to discuss the details of this sad case, but we're going to explore the context around it because it's important. And as most of you know, if you've been here for a while, or maybe even not a while, maybe just a few videos, I'm a sucker for context. I am addicted to context. The who, the why, the where, the how. I mean, it's a little hurtful sometimes because I'm so obsessed with context that it's almost a part of like who I am. It's like a part of my identity and my personality. And sometimes I'll see comments and the comments will say things like, you know, she spends too much time setting the scene. She says she spends too much time setting the stage. I don't think I spend too much time setting the stage, obviously, or I wouldn't be doing it. I think it's just the right amount of time. It's important to feel like you're there to really understand a three-dimensional picture of what we're exploring, but that's just how that's how we do it here. That's how I do things here. So I understand if you don't like it. It's not for everyone, but context is everything. I think it's so important, and it turns a single case or the story of a single person into something so much more alive. And context also helps us understand the why behind the cases we discuss. Why did this happen? So settle in, prepare to have your eyes open to some pretty dark and twisted things that go on in this world, things you may not have known about before. But be warned, you literally may never be the same again. When all is said and done and you've left this video, you may look at things a lot differently. However, before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Casetify. We all know that our cell phones are important to us, right? We may not want to admit it because it's embarrassing to be like, oh my God, my cell phone's my lifeline, but it's true, you know, and it makes sense. Our entire lives are on our phones and they're also super, super expensive. So it makes sense to keep your phone protected and Casetify's protection with personality. Casetify's cases are slim and protective. Their impact cases are engineered with a two-layer construction of Chi-Tech material, and they're drop test approved for drops up to 6.6 feet for impact cases and 9.8 feet for ultra impact cases. These cases also protect you from the stuff you can't see. They have an antimicrobial coating, which keeps your case germ-free, killing 99.9% .9 of bacteria. But your case doesn't have to look protective. It doesn't have to look like, you know, you literally have a bank vault on your phone. Some cases, they look like that. And they feel like that too. Case Defies cases come in a ton of designs with options to customize so that you can make sure your phone case is as interesting as you are. You can pick your favorite color, your favorite print, your favorite design. You can add your name or monogram. And the impact and ultra impact cases are made with 50% recycled material. So you can feel really good about your phone looking great. And I just want to show you these two cases. These aren't for me. Uh, they're, they're actually for somebody else who, who wanted to have my name on their phone case, which is cute. So they're obviously for a smaller phone. But these are Casetify's leather cases, and you can monogram them so beautifully. They feel so soft, so nice. They're easy to clean, and it just comes out beautiful. And you can pick any color for the case and any color for the font. So this one's a gray case with a, like, a forest green, hunter green font. And although these cases are incredibly protective, they don't look huge and bulky. They're slim and light. And you guys know, since it's spooky season, you know, I'm rocking my yoga skeletons. This is like my favorite case. And I said I was only going to use it around Halloween, but I end up putting it on my phone a lot more throughout the year. But the only case I've had on my phone for years is a case to buy case. I won't use any other case because I'm so impressed by how these cases have protected my phone. And I'm rough with her. I don't mean to be... 
had the best intentions, but that's how it be sometimes. And she gets dropped at least half a dozen times a day, but as you can see, in this drop test, she always comes out the other side. And if my phone broke, I can tell you it would put a huge damper on my week. So it's really nice to be able to depend on Casetify to have my phones back because clearly I don't. And if you want to find your new favorite phone case, go to casetify.com slash Stephanie Harlow for 15% off. Once again, that is casetify.com slash Stephanie Harlow for 15% off. And there's an E on the end of Stephanie and Harlow. You can also check out the link in the description box if you just want to click that. Get 15% off your Casetify phone case. Thank you so much to Casetify for sponsoring this video. Let's dive in. It was around 4 p.m. on September 21st, 2001. 32-year-old Aidan Minter was crossing the Tower Bridge in central London. The Tower Bridge is London's defining landmark. It's 800 feet long, with a 200-foot tower on each end, and it stretches over the River Thames, which has its own dark history. Since the days of the Roman Empire, the city of London has depended on the Thames for trade and transport, but the river has claimed its fair share of victims. It is said that on average, one body a week is pulled from the Thames, and those are just the ones that get found. At 215 miles long, the Thames is England's longest river, and the Tower Bridge is just one of the over 200 bridges that span it. It is said that the word Thames comes from the Celtic word Temessa, meaning dark, and some unfortunate and dark things have happened there. Before the year 1830, public executions in London were a regular thing, but those who were found guilty on charges of piracy faced the worst fate. They would be marched over London Bridge to the execution dock, and then the men would be hanged with a shortened rope, and this shortened rope was meant to choke them to death instead of snapping their neck, ensuring that the torture and pain would be prolonged. Once they were gone, their bodies would be cut down and chained to the bank of the Thames until submerged by three tides of the river. On average, 700 people a year attempt to use the Thames to take their own lives. Suicides and attempted suicides from the bridges or the banks of the Thames became such a regular occurrence that Prince William created a program in 2019 to help raise awareness and combat accidents and self-harm along the river. The Thames was also the backdrop for a series of unsolved murders, which took place between the years 1887 and 1889. Four female victims were murdered, and only their torsos were found in the River Thames, and only one of the women was ever identified. The killer has never been found. And for a river so ancient, which holds so many secrets, of course, there are reports that it is haunted. A ghost ship crewed by three ghost men has often been seen on the stretch of the Thames just east of Big Ben. This ship has been spotted as recently as 2014, and it's not just one person who sees it. Multiple people have all witnessed this silent floating ship at the same time. And back in the day, people would ice skate on the Thames in the winter. And in the winter of 1878, a family decided to board a ferry, which would take them to the other side of the river so they could join a group of ice skaters. Unfortunately, the ferry sank that night and claimed the life of one of the family's daughters. And it is said that a ghost of a small girl can still be seen walking along the riverbanks, looking for her mother and father. The most interesting ghost story, though, in my opinion, is one the locals still tell to this day, and it involves an infamous figure from the city of London, Jack the Ripper. The ghosts of some of Jack's victims notoriously haunt this city. Holly Nichols can often be seen in apparition form, huddled on Dunward Street. Annie Chapman has been seen multiple times at 22 Hanbury Street, the home where her murder took place. A man who lived here, who also shared a surname with Annie, claims that for several years during the autumn months and in the very early hours of the morning, he would see the same man and woman disappearing along the passageway, but when he would follow them, no one was there. In the 1930s, several witnesses who were in this home thought they could hear the sounds of a woman being murdered, but when they went to investigate, they found nothing, and many people would see the apparition of a headless phantom floating along the halls. All of these sightings stopped when 29 Hanbury was demolished, but workers at the Truman Brewery building, which now occupies that same site, 
They report that on the anniversary of Annie's death, September 8th, they will get strange chills and sometimes see a ghostly woman standing right on the spot where she was murdered and disemboweled. But old Jack doesn't leave all the fun to the ladies. He's made his own appearances. It is said that on New Year's Eve, a figure emerges from the shadows of Westminster Bridge and throws himself into the depths of the Thames below. Locals say that Jack the Ripper killed himself on New Year's Eve in the year 1888, and he did this by jumping into the river. And in fact, a man suspected of being Jack the Ripper did take his own life in this exact way and on this date. His name was Montag John Druitt, and he was first considered a suspect by Chief Constable Melville in 1894. Druitt was a doctor, he came from a good family, but he had some issues. And Melville felt that even Druitt's own family would not have had a hard time believing that he was Jack the Ripper. Druitt took his own life seven weeks after the Ripper's last victim was found, and to this day on New Year's Eve, locals and tourists alike can sometimes spot what they believe is the ghost of Jack the Ripper performing his final act over and over until the end of eternity. So that brings us back to September 21st, 2001. Aiden Minter on his way to a creative meeting with a design agency. He's crossing the Tower Bridge and he sees something floating in the water of the Thames. Looking back on this day, which ended up causing Aiden Minter a great deal of trauma, he said, quote, the river was coming in from the estuary and it was high tide. Because it wasn't long after the 9-11 attacks, there was nobody around. Normally at that time of day on a Friday afternoon, the bridge is full of tourists and commuters. But I guess the attacks on New York had shattered people's confidence in standing near large landmark buildings. Looking out towards the east as I crossed the bridge, I noticed a pallet and some driftwood moving quite fast in the flow of the river. Beyond that, about 20 feet away, was what I thought was a beer barrel, because it was rounded and bobbing in the water. I had stopped on the bridge by this point, right at the point where the bridge opens to let tall ships pass, and looked over. It was then that I could clearly see that it wasn't a barrel or a tailor's mannequin, but the torso of a small boy. End quote. The authorities were called and the boy's torso was pulled from the Thames upstream near London's Globe Theater. Once on dry land, police were able to see that this body had belonged to a young black boy between the ages of four and seven. His throat had been deliberately slit. He'd been beheaded and his legs and arms had been carefully and expertly removed. To this day, the head and limbs of this young boy have never been found. The only clue that law enforcement could immediately recognize was found in the form of clothing that the boy had been wearing when he'd been placed into the river. He was completely nude, except for a pair of bright orange shorts that had the label Kids and Company in it. This case would become one of London's worst crimes involving a child, and it would bring detectives to many different countries where they were introduced to some of the darkest corners of the world, in their search for answers as to who he was and what had happened to him. Shortly after the discovery of this torso, Detective Superintendent Andy Baker of the Metropolitan Police gave a press conference, during which he said a sharp-bladed instrument had been used to cut the boy. Good afternoon, everyone. On the 21st of September, the body of a child was recovered from the River Thames. Now, we've not identified the child, and consequently, we've taken the unprecedented step Give him a name. It's Adam. Until his family is identified, we will act as his family. And his community will be the community of London. So because they didn't know who this little boy was, they didn't know anything about him, they gave him a name to humanize him, possibly. Why they chose Adam, I couldn't tell you. I don't know if anybody's ever asked them that, but I poured through interviews and all sorts of articles where these detectives, you know, explained what they were doing in the case. And literally nobody ever says why they decided to name him Adam. The Metropolitan Police began their investigation, which they named Operation Swalcliff. It was led by Detective Superintendent Adrian Maybanks, and he enlisted title experts and oceanographers to help figure out where the body 
had been initially placed into the Thames. They deduced that Adam's body had most likely been placed into the river somewhere between Teddington Lock in West London and the Thames Estuary in East London, making the potential point of origin somewhere along a 12-mile radius. Law enforcement gathered surveillance footage from this area, but they were unable to find or see anything. While Adam's autopsy was being done by pathologist Michael Heath, the police searched through reports of missing children, but none of them matched their unidentified victim. Adam's body was completely bloodless, but Michael Heath, the pathologist, was able to determine that he had died in a very violent and brutal way. Adam had not been physically or sexually abused, and he seemed to have been well-fed and cared for, but there were traces of cough medicine found in his stomach and small intestine, along with some other substances that could not be identified and had to be sent off for further analysis. And it made people wonder, why did he have cough medicine in his system? Was he sick? Had he been fed this cough medicine? Did somebody care enough for him to give him medicine to help him with a cough or a stuffy nose or a sore throat? And if he was so well cared for, how did he end up in the River Thames? Without his head, without his arms, without his legs, and his throat slit to the point of beheading. Michael Heath said that Adam had most likely been placed into the water within 24 hours of his death, and he'd been in the river for at least 10 days. If the tide had gone in and out just once more, his body would have been washed out to sea, and he never would have been found, which is most likely the outcome his killer or killers had been hoping for. The autopsy also revealed that the cuts where Adam's head and limbs had been removed, they were made with a very sharp knife and with the precision of a trained surgeon. The only other lead the police had to go on were the orange shorts that Adam had been wearing. The shorts were traced back to a batch of 820 pairs of kids and company orange shorts. And these 820 pairs had been in the sizes five to seven. The shorts had been manufactured in China, but they were sold at 320 Woolworth stores around Germany, and they had started being sold in these stores just a few weeks before Adam's death. The Metropolitan Police contacted law enforcement in the Netherlands to explore this piece of evidence, and they were informed of another case that might have been connected to Adam. The body of a four-year-old girl had been found dismembered on a beach in Naldi. The two cases turned out to not be connected, however, when the girl was identified months later as Rowena Rickers. Right after her body had been found, Rowena's mother and Rowena's mother's boyfriend, Mike, had run away to Spain, but they were eventually tracked down and Mike was charged with Rowena's murder. So this was a dead end. But the shorts only being sold at Woolworth stores in Germany was still an important factor, and detectives knew that Germany was an important piece of this puzzle because they also knew that Germany was a common route and a hub for those in the business of human trafficking. In January of 2002, The Guardian reported that London police had found a shrine of some sort. And this shrine included seven half-burned candles wrapped in a white sheet, and it had washed up on the southern shore of the Thames. The name, Adequia Jafola Adoya, was written on the sheet and carved into the candles, and this led police to speculate if the candles and the sheet were connected to Adam, and perhaps this was his real name. Detective Will O'Reilly said, quote, We know with some certainty that the candles and the sheet form part of a ritualistic ceremony. We can't say if they are connected, but at the moment we are linking them. The circumstances of this murder are unique. If the murder is ritualistic, we believe it is the first in this country, end quote. I guess maybe the first in the country, like the modern country, but obviously not the first ritualistic murder in that area in all of history, right? So of course, this news hit London in some sort of way. Ritualistic murders were a thing of the past or something that happened in far away, less developed countries or something that didn't even happen at all. Something that was made up for shock value on movies and television. I got called as being the on call for South London that day and, and presumed it was just a normal killing. It was, might have been a, it might have even been an accident. We often find bodies floating in the Thames, which are then, you know, hit by boats, etc. So I have 
very distinct injuries. Um, but as soon as I saw, I got called here, saw the child's body, um, and it was a uh, small torso of a young black boy, we knew we were dealing with something different. To hear that a child may have been brutally murdered for some sort of ritual, it shook everyone to their core. Police eventually tracked the candles and sheet back to a Nigerian family living in London. Their son had been in New York City during the attacks on the World Trade Center and his parents had used the candles to pray for his safe return. So in a way, I guess it was a ritual and I guess it worked because this man did end up coming home safe and sound. But this clue had brought the topic of ritual murder to the forefront. And even though this specific family had not been connected, the police felt, due to the way Adam had been found, that it was still a huge possibility that he may have been killed in a ritual murder, and they began to explore the theory of whether or not Adam had been the victim of Muti. Now, we have talked about this in a past video that I did about ritual killings in South Africa, but I'm still going to go over it in this video in case you never saw that one or in case you've forgotten, because I think it's been over a year. Muti is a traditional medicine practice in South Africa, and its traditional healers are called Sangomas, who are considered to be trusted advisors on matters of the body, mind, and spirit. London police got in contact with the experts on this subject, the Investigative Psychology Unit, or IPU, located in Pretoria, South Africa. The IPU was first established in 1996 as a division of the Serious and Violent Crimes Unit, and it was led by Professor Gerard Labouchon. The unit assists in the investigations of psychologically motivated crimes that might have no clear external motive, like money. So for instance, if you're a police officer and you find a body laying on the ground and this person is dead, and you find out that they don't have their wallet or their watch or their wedding ring, you can clearly see what the motive was. This person was murdered so that he could be robbed. But if you come across the body and you can't figure out why that person was killed, you don't have a clear cut answer as to why they lost their life, that's when the IPU would come in. The IPU is also heavily trained to recognize the signs of ritualistic murder, which is quite common in South Africa. An article in the New York Times said, quote, in Africa's richest and most developed society, there may be no more bare and more sensitive divide between past and present than this. Muti murders, especially of children, remain disturbingly common. South Africa's police force investigates an average of one a month." End quote. Now, the most common forms of Muti can be pretty benign. A client will visit the Sangoma with a complaint of an upset stomach or a headache, or maybe they want, you know, to make some handsome man in the village fall in love with them. And then they will be handed a potion made from herbs and plants. But some ailments, some problems, some desires, they call for more complex potions. And in that case, some Sangomas may make a potion which contains the body parts of animals, like monkeys or birds. Unfortunately, even that sometimes doesn't bring the desired effect. And if you have the money to put on the table, certain Sangomas will provide you with the body parts from humans, which are used when the client needs something very powerful. The belief system states that human beings are all born with a certain amount of luck, and some go through their luck at faster rates, and then they need their luck filled up again so they can get a promotion or land a big deal or have a great harvest. The belief also follows that young children have barely touched their stores of luck, so they are considered to be especially powerful if their body parts are used in these potions. Gerard Labochon, head of the IPU, said, quote, I don't think these beliefs are limited to a certain class of people or even a certain level of education. To some who believe the supernatural can determine one's success and that plant or animal-based mixtures ward off evil, human muti is just pushing the envelope a little further, end quote. I mean, <laughs> I don't know about Gerard. Maybe he's seen some crazy shit in his life as the head of the IPU. I'm sure he has. Maybe, you know, all of this crazy stuff now just seems run of the mill to him, but I'd have to say that in my opinion, graduating from sacrificing animals to sacrificing human children, it's pushing the envelope more than a little bit further, right? Just a lot more, like a lot more. Gerard's over here like, yeah, these people, you know, they sacrifice animals. They just, you know, push the envelope a little, sacrifice humans, challenging themselves, learning, growing. It's, it's crazy.
Muti is unfortunately quite common, and although it seems to happen much more in rural areas, evidence of it is found in even bigger, more progressive cities. In 2003, a young boy had vanished while his mother slept, and his body was later found wrapped in a garbage bag and buried under a thin layer of dirt. The boy was missing several body parts, including his left hand, his genitals, his brain, his heart, and several other vital organs. Now, the community around this mother was sure that their local Sangoma had been responsible for the child's demise. Body parts from children are highly desirable and they bring in a high price, you know, it's, it's like a commodity. And it was said that parts harvested from a living victim are the most potent because their tortured screams can awaken supernatural powers. Like I said, it's common, but a lot of people are sort of scared of it. They might not believe it. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying if you're South African or you live in South Africa, you're over here, like, killing children for their body parts. Not at all. It's a, a small minority of people. A lot of people know that it happens, but they're like, we don't really believe in it, but we also don't want to, like, go up against it in case it's real and then they're going to, like, hex us. So there's a very um, pervasive belief in these things that runs deep. And it's also very secretive because you don't want to be the person to turn the Sangoma in. But can you imagine if you're this little boy's mother and you woke up from a nap and he's gone and he's found in this condition, cut up like a science experiment, wrapped in a garbage bag, buried hastily and half-heartedly under just enough dirt so that he's not immediately seen because these people really don't care if they get caught. They're just going to deny it. And a lot of the villagers said they had seen this boy in the Sangoma's hut, and then they'd heard, you know, drums and chanting and sounds of a ritual happening, but then the police show up and the guy's like, I don't know, wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me. If that had been my son, man, oh, I would have set the Sangoma's hut on fire. He would have definitely also been missing his genitals. Like, I just, I, I would have set the whole village on fire. I would have been so, how do you survive? Oh, it's just, it's mind-blowing to me that on top of, all the other things you have to worry about in, in the world. If you live in, in these certain villages, these certain areas in South Africa, you have to worry that some guy is going to come and steal your child while you're sleeping so that he can cut your child's body parts off and sell them to people. And I think it's so easy for us in America to look at that in a very disconnected way. That's not me. That's not my country. I don't live there. But we could. We could live there. We could have been born there. There's people who live there every day who are just trying to get through their lives the same as us, and they have to deal with this on top of everything else I just can't imagine. So when the London authorities arrived in South Africa, the IPU already had their hands filled with several other cases of ritual murder because they're dealing with this stuff all the time. Earlier in the month, they'd arrested six men for trying to sell a human head, human hands and feet, a human heart and genitals. And on September 20th, 2001, just one day before Adam was found, the head of a five-year-old boy had been found floating by a dam in Johannesburg. Gerard Lubachon told CNN, quote, The removal of the genitals is very characteristic. The parts have different meanings. A hand might be used by a businessman who wants to attract customers. Genitals are a source of good luck, end quote. So I was reading a lot into this, and I'd already known a lot from when I did this last video in South Africa, but I learned a lot more. And so if a shopkeeper feels like their store isn't busy enough, they'll buy a human hand and bury it, <laughs> like, in front of the store. And this is supposed to attract customers to the store. I don't know how, but... It's supposed to. There have also been cases where a human brain was eaten in order for the recipient, the, the eater, to pass an exam or get into college. Most people in South Africa will express that they're disgusted by this. They are adverse to it. They don't believe in it. But they don't want to mess with the Moody anyways, just in case. Anthony Minar, he's a researcher in Johannesburg. He claims that Muti killings shine a light on an aspect of an ancient culture that modern South Africans want to pretend does not exist. Minar said, quote, It points to a belief in witchcraft and spirit worship, things people don't want to acknowledge. End quote. Statistics show that one in five people in the rural areas of South Africa have firsthand experience with Muti killings. So they have a friend or a family member who has been 
taken and used for these these Muti killings. They know of somebody, somebody in the village. They have firsthand experience with it. Women who want to become pregnant and are having a hard time conceiving, they'll be told to wear a belt with children's genitals and fingers hanging from it. Fishermen would attach the belly buttons of children to their nets, hoping to improve their catch. So it's bananas. And I know a lot of us hear like human sacrifice and we're like, okay, that doesn't happen. It happens. However, the experts on Muti at the IPU, they told the investigators on Adam's case that they did not believe Adam's death had been a Muti killing due to the fact that his genitals and internal organs had remained untouched and a Sangoma would have harvested those since they're considered to be very powerful. So even if Adam was killed for Muti and the person who paid for his body parts only wanted his head, the Sangoma would still have taken all that other stuff because he could sell it. However, the detectives from London still felt that little Adam had been killed as part of some sort of ritual sacrifice. So they were put in touch with a local Sangoma named Credo Matwa. They wanted him to offer his personal opinion on the death of Adam. And Matwa told police that he believed Adam had been killed for ritualistic purposes, but it was not Muti. It was something different. He believed that Adam's injuries were more consistent with the Yoruban people. Yoruba are one of the three largest ethnic groups of Nigeria, which is in West Africa. Whereas we were just in South Africa, now we are moving to West Africa. According to a paper written in the Journal of Religion in Africa, sacrifice is an idea and an institution that is deeply rooted in the thoughts and practices of the Yoruba. Many Yorubans believe in a god they call Olorun, but in order to bridge the gap, between the heavens and the earthly plane, Olorun requires a blood sacrifice. So for instance, a man building a new home for his family would slaughter a goat and then drain the goat of its blood and then pour the blood of that goat into a small hole that was dug into the ground in the place where the house would be built before the foundation was laid. The severed head of the murdered goat would be wrapped in a sheet and also buried there. The offering of the sacrifice testifies to an important belief among the Yoruba that they depend on supernatural beings for life and preservation. So the spirits need to be kept happy and peaceful at all times. And if they're in the right mood and they're happy and they're at peace, they'll listen to the people and their prayers and their wishes and desires. Now, in order to be able to communicate with the spirits, a sacrifice is needed. Human sacrifice specifically was traditionally only done during times of great unrest or national crisis with the intention of reaching certain divine spirits who were powerful and who would help purify the community and repair them from damage and grief. We know historically that humans who were sacrificed for these purposes were usually well fed before their sacrifice and the favorite color of Oliron would be used in some way and that color was dark orange or red. Additionally, among the Yoruba, it is believed that the life force of a person is in their blood, which is why the blood of a sacrificed victim is usually drained and presented to the deity in a pot. Sometimes the head as well as limbs may also be placed in the pot with some palm oil before being put under a tree as an offering for the divine spirits. So the London police are in South Africa talking to the Sangoma and he's basically saying this isn't Muti. This isn't something you would see in South Africa. It's something you would see amongst the Yorubans in West Africa. Credo Mutwa said that Adam being found in a river wearing orange shorts was significant because Oshan is a Yoruban river goddess and the color most associated with Oshan is orange. With this knowledge, the Metropolitan Police called on Dr. Hendrik Skoltz, a South African expert in ritualistic and witchcraft murders. He was tasked with performing a second post-mortem examination on Adam, and his findings were reported to detectives from across the United Kingdom at a conference held at the National Police Training College. Professor Schultz told those in attendance that Adam's body bore all the hallmarks of a ritualistic death, and he said, quote, It is my opinion that the nature of the discovery of the body Features of the external examination, including the nature of the wounds, clothing, and mechanisms of death, are consistent with those of ritual homicide as practiced in Africa. End quote. Due to the findings of tool marks on Adam's bones, Schultz believed that the young boy had been alive when his throat had been slit and he had been beheaded. And this had been done by somebody who knew what they were doing and who had probably 
done this multiple times before, so an experienced and trained priest of sorts. In a summary of what had been discovered by Professor Skoltz, The Guardian published an article in which was written, quote, In a horrific operation, reminiscent of animal sacrifice, the flesh around the limbs and neck was first cut down to the bones, which were then slashed with a single blow from an implement much like a butcher's meat cleaver. Adam would have been stretched out horizontally or upside down during the sacrifice and kept in that position while the blood was drained from the body. End quote. The detectives on Adam's case believed that the level of expertise needed to complete this in the way that it was done, it meant whoever had been responsible for Adam's death had brought in an elder who had expertise on these kinds of rituals, most likely imported from out of the UK, and Adam's arms, legs, and head would probably never be found because these body parts would have been kept as powerful magical trophies. Or to place in a pot with blood and palm oil and put it at the base of a tree. Okay, so Adam's body is found, or his torso, it's completely bloodless. And so obviously they're gonna have a little bit more of a difficult time uh, getting his DNA profile, but they were able to actually get Adam's DNA profile so that they could match it. And this was a way that they would often rule out parents or family members who would come to them and say, my son's missing, he's around this age. They would then test the parent's DNA, compare it to Adam's DNA, and they would be able to tell that this was not their son. But with very little else to go on, I mean, the poor kid's head's missing, so you can't tell what he looks like. His arms are gone, so even if he'd ever been fingerprinted, you wouldn't be able to know. There's really nothing you can see to identify him or figure out where he came from. So the police and many experts in their fields, like fields of education, science, um, anthropology, this is so cool, but they came together and they did some hardcore, impressive, progressive forensic work on Adam's body, what was left of it. So they wanted to perform these in-depth forensic tests on Adam to hopefully figure out where he had come from. Commander Andy Baker said, quote, All we have is the trunk of a little boy and a very small pair of shorts. But when the work on the forensics identifies his home, we will go to that country and make direct contact with the government involved. End quote. In March of 2002, the police told the media that they had started conducting forensic testing on Adam's torso. And listen, the authorities did some really good work here because this case could have been one of those needle in a haystack cases. It could have been that this small boy was found and because there were literally zero leads, the investigation never went any further and maybe we never hear about it. And this young boy doesn't have his story told and his story to live on. But for this case, they pulled out all the stops. So obviously, like I said, they did DNA tests, they tested whatever they could, they looked at the contents of his stomach, et cetera, et cetera. They also did um, bone testing, something that's often used in anthropology when trying to determine an area of origin. While this was happening, Will O'Reilly and Andy Baker traveled to South Africa to meet with Nelson Mandela, hoping that with his help, they could reach the people of Africa and someone who knew something might come forward. Maybe somebody would say, actually, my son's missing. I didn't even hear about this Adam boy in the Thames. My son's been missing. It could be him. And then they could DNA test those people. Now, obviously, Mandela was loved and highly respected by the people of Africa. I mean, by the people of the world. And he did his best to help shine a light on who Adam was and to urge people to come forward if they knew anything. If anywhere... Even in the remotest village of our continent, there is a family missing a son of that age who might have disappeared around that time, 21st of September 2001. Please contact the police in London. I wish to repeat my appeal to all people across the world, and specifically in Africa, to come forward and help her bring to justice the killers of this young boy. Mandela's message was broadcast across the country in many different languages. Unfortunately, no new leads came in as a result of Mandela's impassioned plea. But back in London, results were starting to come in from the forensic testing. And the results would bring this case to a whole new and more terrifying level. 
Using cutting-edge forensic science, investigators were able to pinpoint the exact location that Adam had come from. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. And they were also able to have a better understanding of his last days and his last moments, which were not happy or pleasant. They concluded that Adam had been born in West Africa, specifically Benin City in southern Nigeria. They brought in Professor Kenneth Pye, a forensic geologist from the Royal Holloway University in London. Pye had been doing some great work with isotopes, and this is commonly used in anthropological research. We talked about it in the Isdell Woman videos. I'll link those if you haven't watched them. I think it might have only been one video. But we talked about isotope testing and how they were able to figure out you know, where she had come from, things like that. So isotopes are basically atoms. They have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. And our bodies are made up of them. Isotopes are found in our hair, our skin, nails, bones, teeth, and muscle tissue. And investigators can use clues from these isotopes to figure out where and how a person lived their life. So obviously our hair grows you know, and our skin sloughs off and then comes back anew. So it's less um, likely that you'll get a really good and specific indicator from the isotopes in the hair and skin. But the isotopes in bones and teeth, which change very little over time, can provide a wealth of longitudinal knowledge. Oxygen isotopes that fall from rain clouds will accumulate in our drinking water. Carbon and nitrogen isotopes give clues about a person's diet. Carbon isotopes would show what kind of plant life they'd eat and what kind of vegetation. Nitrogen isotopes show if they've eaten any kind of meat. But Professor Kenneth Pye looked at Adam's strontium isotopes, which are like earth isotopes. Ray Fish, a specialist advisor to the Forensic Science Service, said, quote, Strontium isotopes go unchanged in ratio from rock to soil to water to plants. Animals then eat the plants and drink the water. We then eat the plants and the animals, and they get passed on to us and stored in our bones in the same ratio. So basically, the ratio of strontium isotopes in the soil will be mimicked in our bone chemistry, end quote. How cool is that? It's like everything we ingest, everything we eat is leaving its own signature in our bodies. The results from Adam's isotopes showed a reasonably high strontium isotope ratio signature, and this indicated rocks of the pre-Cambrian era, over 2,500 million years old. And this was two and a half times higher than would have been expected to be seen in a child who'd grown up in England. This narrowed down the search for Adam's birthplace to West Africa, specifically Nigeria and parts of neighboring countries. This was a great start, really impressive work. But if they wanted to uncover where Adam had started his short life, where exactly he'd been born and lived and brought up, they needed to put in some extra work. A small team of investigators traveled to Nigeria to collect samples to compare to Adam's isotope map so that they could make a more in-depth isotope map of West Africa, and they could see where specifically Adam's isotope signature brought them to. They collected plants, soil, water, rocks. They even went to morgues and slaughterhouses to collect samples of both animal and human tissue. The samples were then sent to Professor Kenneth Pye, who then narrowed Adam's birthplace down to Benin City, a place where many Yorubans live. But of course, the investigators, they wanted to know more about Adam, how he had gotten from Benin City to London, how long had he been in the UK, and what had happened to him? Where were his parents? Did he have family? Did he have people looking for him? Now, Adam's upper intestine was empty, meaning that he had not eaten directly before his death. Pollen spores from the alder tree were also found in Adam's stomach, in his lower intestine. Now, the alder tree is commonly found in England, as well as some northwestern European countries. And the pollen was found in his stomach. So they tried to figure out, like, could he have eaten this, maybe in cereal or something? And they went to the grocery store, and they actually tested all this food to see if it had this pollen in it, and it didn't. So they knew that Adam had ingested this pollen at some point while he was in England because that pollen wouldn't have been found in West Africa where he was from. There were also traces of a food substance in Adam's lower intestine and this suggested he'd been given something to eat within 72 hours of his death, which led investigators to believe that Adam had only been in London for roughly three days before his death. 
Now, this is very interesting. Clay pellets with flecks of real pure gold were found in Adam's intestines, and these were tracked to a river in West Africa. Adam had a slightly enlarged spleen, which has never been explained, but there's multiple reasons he could have. He also had cough syrup in his system and some other substances that needed further testing to identify. Well, when that material was identified, it painted an even more gruesome picture. The unknown substance was a mixture of ground up bones, whether they were animal or human could never be determined, and ground up um, clay pellets and ground up caliber beans. The caliber bean is highly poisonous to humans, but given in small doses, it acts as a paralytic. Now, the combination of substances did not make sense to law enforcement, so they called in an expert, Dr. Richard Hoskins, a senior lecturer in African religions. Hoskins had also spent some time in Africa in the 1980s, where he worked at a medical center in a small village in the Congo Basin, and he had seen there firsthand what he thought to be the superstitious nature of the locals. Now, this personal story of Hoskins is very sad and incredibly sobering, but I think it's important to tell it. I think it's important to tell it and to hear it for many different reasons, but it does speak to the context of this case. So while in the Congo, Hoskins' wife, Sue, became pregnant with twins, but during labor, one of the babies was breech and the little girl didn't make it. The second baby was born alive. She was a two pound little girl that they would name Abigail and they were scared at first that she wouldn't survive because she was so tiny, but she did survive and she grew and she flourished. But when she was still a small child, Hoskins got a visit from one of the men in the village. And this man said he had a very important matter to discuss with Richard Hoskins. This man told Hoskins that his surviving daughter was not well and that she was being called from the other side by her twin sister, the baby who had been born dead. Richard Hoskins talked about this in his book, and he's repeated this story to many reporters, but he claims the man said, quote, you must understand this, Mr. Richard. It is very important. We, you and I and everyone, are the living living. The living dead are those whom we once knew on this earth, but who have passed on to the shadowlands beyond the grave. They guard us, but they can also harm us. Our living dead are more alive than we are. The living dead control this world and everything in it. They bring life and they take it away. They tell us what to do. And twins have special powers, Mr. Richard. M. Bo is calling your Empia to come and join her in the Shadowlands. I am sure of it, end quote. So Richard Hoskins says that um, Mpia is the name that the locals give for a younger twin, and Mpo is the name they give to the older twin. So this man was basically saying that Abigail's dead twin sister was reaching out to her from beyond the grave, trying to get Abigail to join her in the Shadowlands on the other side. Now, Richard Hoskins said that his initial impulse was to recoil from this macabre superstition, but he said the man seemed genuinely scared for Richard and his family, and he seemed like he was really just trying to help. The man told Richard Hoskins that he needed to go and see the Naganga, which is the traditional healer or a shaman in their village, and this healer would call upon the living dead and make them stop their relentless pulling on baby Abigail, but blood would need to be spilled first. The man told Hoskins that if he did not want to lose his daughter, he would have to perform a sacrifice. Now, Richard Hoskins went over this in his head. He remembered seeing the Naganga sacrifice a live goat by hanging it upside down and slitting its throat. He could still hear the terrified bleeding of the goat crying like a baby as it was being murdered. In an article he wrote for the Daily Mail, Richard Hoskins said, quote, I couldn't possibly get into this. The very idea was absurd. Yet, I had not instantly dismissed it. Perhaps I'd spent too long out in the villages. And besides, I loved Abigail so much. Could it really do any harm to cover all the bases? For the cost of a single goat, it would be over and done with. But I knew it would not be as simple as that. There is a bridge to be crossed when stepping into a strange culture. And once crossed, there's no way back. If I made that sacrifice, I would cease to be Western. I would open a door in my mind and perhaps in my soul to alien demons, end quote. Richard Hoskins eventually made the decision against sacrificing a live goat. He couldn't make that leap to actually believing that it would do something, but he did 
struggle and wrestle with it in his mind. Well, uh, I got a visit one day. Which basically, the second the second daughter Abigail was unwell, and uh, the I got a visitor who came to say the reason she's unwell is that the first twin is calling her. Uh, and this, this opened me up into a world, uh, a spirit world, if you like, that I was totally unfamiliar with. I was just a home counties, you know, young man going out idealistic to help in Africa. Mm. And it opened this whole world up to me. And he, he said, you need to perform a sacrifice. You spill the blood of a goat or a chicken, spill the blood, your daughter will be fine. And that was the confrontation. I tell this story in the book. And the two, the two stories run parallel through, through the boy in the river. Um, and it took me to this point where I, I suppose like any parent, any parent watching this will think, well, if you thought it would work, would, would you, you do, do it? it? Would you do that? And you didn't. And you didn't. I didn't. And? My second daughter died. Abigail died. Now, a month later, Richard Hoskins found his 18-month-old daughter, Abigail, silently standing by a window that looked out on a hill that overlooked the Congo River. Abigail was not usually this quiet and still, and Richard became worried, even more so when he said her name, and she looked up at him. Hoskins said, quote, she turned her head and the expression on her small face, normally as bright as a new flower, lifted the hairs on the back of my neck. There was something in her eyes I had never seen before, something that made her look old beyond her years. She turned away to stare out of the window again. This was the only point in the house from which it was possible to see the graveyard, end quote. This was the graveyard which had become Abigail's sister's final resting place. Abigail sadly died two weeks later on July 24th, 1989, and they never knew why. There hadn't been anything wrong with her besides a small fever. She was buried next to her sister, and Richard went back to the Western world without either of his girls. So, the calabar beans, the clay pellets with specks of real gold, the cough syrup, what did it all mean? According to Richard Hoskins, these ingredients were mixed together to form a lumpy porridge of sorts, and due to the presence of carbon and tin, it had clearly been heated up over a fire before being mixed with the cough medicine to make the dry concoction easier for Adam to swallow. Hoskins claimed that Yorubans would make this potion and heat it up in a tin container over an open flame before feeding it to their sacrificial victim, and they would do this between 24 to 48 hours before the sacrifice was to be performed. Having lived in Africa for a, a number of years and traveled there extensively, I knew that there were different types of killing that take place, both of animals and occasionally, very rarely, of humans. The contents of Adam's stomach, both the, the, the main intestine and lower intestine, did point towards him being prepared. Certain things were found there that seemed to have suggested that he was being prepared by um, some deviant priest um, in the community that was getting him ready for sacrifice. Hodgkins also pointed to the fact that Adam was circumcised, which was not common in South Africa, where circumcision was a rite of manhood, but in Nigeria, circumcision was usually done at birth. So what seems to have happened before Adam was murdered, um, he was fed a substance that had a paralytic in it, which would mean that, you know, shortly after ingesting this, Adam would not be able to move any longer. So he would be aware of what was happening to him. He'd be able to feel and experience everything. He'd be able to see what was about to happen, but he would be unable to move, unable to fight, and unable to scream. And this was done to a child under the age of seven. It is believed that Adam was taken from his home in Benin City, flown to Germany, and then taken via ferry to Hamburg, where he was guarded for a few weeks before being transported to London. Everything that had been done to Adam in the days and weeks before his death had been done to prepare him to be a human sacrifice, including the wearing of the orange shorts. Hoskins claims that a few days after he'd given some media interviews about Adam, he'd gotten a call from a West Africa phone number. And this was from a woman claiming to be Princess Tania Olesongo. And Princess Tania accused Hoskins of wronging the Yoruban people. She told him to retract his statements at once or he would be ruined. She said, quote, I am warning you of this. There are more of us. We will ask Oshun for help to bring you down, end quote. And then she hung up. Now, despite this, Hoskins did not waver from his public opinion that Adam's death had been a human sacrifice in alignment with Yoruban practices. The meticulous and expert way Adam's head and limbs had been removed, the disposal of his body in a flowing river, the orange shorts, Hoskins said that while Muti 
was mainly concerned with harvesting body parts, ritual sacrifice is about a transference of power via the spilling of blood. Hoskins said, quote, the Yorubans are a powerful group, mostly from central and southwest Nigeria. Many Nigerians living abroad are also Yorubans. They have the most complex and sophisticated religious belief system of any ethnic group on the African continent. In Yoruban religion, the many deities form a bridge between this world and the higher realms. They require sacrifice, not necessarily human sacrifice, of course, and especially not nowadays, but the practice persists in some deviant offshoots of Yoruban religion. End quote. What is, what is the reason people do this? What, is the, what do they think is going to happen by sacrificing a child? Well, I think what they thought was that um, it would bring them power. We, we don't know the exact reason, but there have been some reports from people who were inside the case to say that it's to bring, bring them power for something that they needed here in London. And I, I suppose that's the most mind-blowing thing. So basically what Hoskins is saying and what he really stresses constantly, because he wants everyone to know, like, don't just look at... Africa is this land of people running around killing each other for body parts or to sacrifice to the gods. There are people who still believe in this. There are people who still perform animal sacrifice. And there are people who still perform human sacrifice. But the people who perform human sacrifice are usually not, you know, accepted into society, into social circles. They're sort of like ostracized or they do it under the cover of dark or in secret because they know that it'll be frowned upon. So it's not everybody. It's not like everybody who is from Nigeria is, you know, kidnapping people and sacrificing them to the gods. That's not the case. And I don't want anybody to have a negative view of Africa or their religions because it's interesting. And not only that, it's part of their culture. And it's important that they hold on to that part of their culture, but maybe forego the human sacrifice. I'm thinking maybe even foregoing the animal sacrifice, but it's none of my business. All right. It's none of my business. You guys do you, but um, maybe no, no more humans. But I think it is very important for different countries to hold on to their culture. It's what makes us all special and different and interesting. So interesting. Like the most interesting person I'm going to talk to is the person who is exactly the opposite of me. Because I already know me. I already know what I like. I already know what I like to do. And it's fun sometimes to share similarities with people. You're like, oh, my favorite actor is Denzel Washington. And they're like, me too. And you're like, that's awesome. But my most favorite person to talk to is somebody that I can learn something from, somebody who speaks a different language, comes from a different culture, has lived in different countries. Those are my favorite people. And that is where I'm going to end part one. I'm breaking this up into two parts because there's just so much more to cover. And it'll be easier for me to edit and get this out quicker if it's not two hours long. But Believe me when I say this, the next and last part, it holds so, so much unexpectedness, okay? Try to hold yourself back from looking up information. I'm going to make sure that these videos come out only a day or two apart so you don't have to wait long and you don't feel compelled to find out what happened yourselves because I dug deep, followed my nose. I found myself in places where I looked around. I was like, how did I get here? This is dark. This is creepy, but there you have it. It's all for context, and I'm obsessed with context. So join me next time. Like I said, part two, I will not make you wait a week for it or even three or four days, like one or two days tops. Thank you guys so much for being here. Hit the like button if you liked the video. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. I do think it's worth sharing, if I do say so myself. Yeah. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And go ahead and let me know what you think about this so far in the comment section. I am very excited for the kinds of conversations that we are all going to have. Also, thank you so much to my Patreons. I love you guys so much. And I've been busy, so busy through Halloween. They really put up with me and my absence. And um, I love them. So thank you all so much. Stay kind. Stay beautiful. Stay spooky, and I will see you very soon.
channel in my song house.